know some of you know me. Some of you are related to me when they claim me. Uh, some of you have been friends and family for a long time. Brother Mark has known me and our family for a long time. We originated in the town of Elkmont, and so uh, two Elkmont boys wound up in Tanner, you know, but he's not with us tonight. But uh, I do appreciate the opportunity. I now reside in Priceville, Alabama. They hired me as their minister a few years ago, and so we've been able to be there and serve the congregation there. And God's been very good to me and allowed me to do the things that I seek to do, to serve Him, to proclaim His gospel all throughout the world to the best of my ability. And so I thank you for the invite tonight and for the invitation. If you have your Bibles, I hope you'll go ahead and open them. We'll be in them tonight. We're primarily going to be in the book of 1 John. 1 John in just a few moments. But before we get there, we're going to share a few more introductory verses. It seems to me that the world is very confused. It seems to me that the world wants to make its own decisions. It wants to live its own way. It wants to make its own rules. It wants to do all of these things, and then when it doesn't work out, they want to raise their hands and get angry and sort of blame God. At least that's an observation. And the writer in Proverbs, he says, A man is right in his own ways, but it leads to destruction. And so God doesn't want to leave us to our own minds and our own devices. He gives us instruction. He gives us a pattern. He gives us a way that we can deal with all of this confusion that's going on. People seem to be confused about who God made them to be. People seem to be confused about their identity and all kinds of issues and all of that stems from them not following God. Structure. And so in the beginning of January of this year, I put together sort of a lesson plan to help us make sure we didn't get confused, to help us make sure we stay focused to God, to make sure we stay focused on living out God's plan. And so I don't do this every week, but probably once a month or so we have a lesson geared towards this idea and it's been our theme for this whole year and so I'd like to kind of share that idea with you tonight and you can take it and make it better and add your own notes but our main theme and our main question we want to ask is who are you living for in 2024 and in this society a lot of people want to promote self a lot of people want to say well I think or I feel, or it should be this way, or it should be that way, or, you know, you should do this or that. And all of those are opinion and preface-based based matters. And so when we have those ideas and those decisions, God will help us decide. And so I ask the question, who are we living for? And it's, do we live for self and the heart and in our own flesh and our own bellies and our own desires? Or as Christians, that's already decided for us. We say, are we living for self or are we living for God? And so the direction of our time together tonight, I want to introduce us to some thoughts and there'll be some scriptures that you're welcome to read along with to help kind of shape and mold our minds in this direction to help us be more spiritual. If you look at any successful leader... One of the key things to their success is consistency, meaning they do the same things. They do the same processes. They have the same routines. They have the same strategies because they work, and they know it works. God's Word has existed since the beginning of time. Genesis chapter 1 and verse number 1 says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The God we worship, the God we serve is not bound by any of the things that the human mind tries to bind him to. He's not bound by time. 
He's not bound by space. He's not bound by matter. And Genesis answers all of those questions. In the beginning, there's our time. God created the heavens and the earth. There's the space and the matter. You see, God made all of those things, and so he's not subject to those things. So the God we serve, the God we worship, has the authority and the ability to tell us how to live our lives that are focused on him, that brings us to a life that motivates us so that when we leave earth, we get our home in heaven. But we've got work to do. It's not all just easy for us. It's not all just given to us. Christ made it very simple, but he didn't say it would always be simple. He didn't say it would always be easy. He did say there's going to be some commitment at the end of our lesson. We'll talk more about that. But the general question that I want to kind of focus and shape our minds on is who are we living our lives for? And the world and the society says one thing, but the Christians and the Lord's church says our life is living for God, that we are to serve him and we are to live him. So what does that look like? What helped us with some of this confusion? God gives us some scriptures. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, Paul writing to the brethren in Corinth, he says there's no need for the church to be confused. The world, they're going to do their thing. They're going to have these worldly ideas. They're going to want to serve themselves. They're going to want to make their pockets bigger, their bellies bigger. They're going to do things that benefit them. And when that's the case and we're trying to serve God, it creates this struggle. It creates this imbalance of which way do I go? And Christians... Paul helps answers that. The brethren in Corinth, they had some struggles. They had some difficulties. If you read the first few chapters of Corinthians, you'll see some of the things they're arguing about. One of the first things Paul says in 1 verse 10 is, don't be divided. Have no divisions. Don't have this confusion. And then he comes back later and he says, God does not promote confusion. God gives us peace. God gives us comfort. God gives us assurance. God says all the churches, all the people that claim the name Christian can have peace. No need for us to be confused. No need for us to wonder and what, what, fight, try to find which way we are to go. God tells us. He says he gives us peace. He gives us confidence. And he also gives us some help in his word. John 17 in verse number 17, most of you probably know this passage by heart, but a very powerful passage nonetheless. It says, sanctify them by your truth. Make them the people of God. Make them pure. Make them righteous. And how do I get to that level? Who do I want to live for? And then he says, your word is truth. God's word gives us that Assurance. God's word gives us that direction. God's word gives us that idea. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. Everything Jesus did was accordance to God. It was in accordance to following him. It was in accordance to his will. As he's praying, Lord, don't do what I want to do. Lord, let your will be done. We know his famous prayer as he's going to the cross. And he's asking God, he says, if there's any other way, if there's any other form, if, if there can be something else that is done, can we do that? <laughs> but then he says, don't listen to me, Lord. Let your will be done. And, of course, we know that was his will. We know that he had to go to the cross for us, that he had to give us that direction. He had to give us that purification. He had to give us his word so we don't have to worry about being confused. So I've got our study tonight broken down in three parts. 
And we're going to read 1 John chapter 4. He gives us some help. He gives us some guidance. I know a lot of times when we mention the word spirit, sometimes we kind of worry about it. Sometimes we're uncomfortable about it. Sometimes we say, well, I don't know, and I'm unsure, and so I just want to ignore it. But, you know, God tells us there's three parts to his existence. When we baptize somebody, we say, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so when we talk about these things of God, the Holy Spirit is a part of it. And so sometimes we get kind of confused or worried or afraid, but it's not really that big a deal because John helps us understand how that works. And as a Christian, as I grow and as I mature and as I live for God more and more each day, I begin to understand it's not so frightening. It's not so scary. But some things aren't from God. Some things are from Satan. He exists and he tempts us. And so John uses this term and he's using it as a term of endearment. It's, it's kind of like a, a special group. You have a special friend and you might have a nickname for them. And so John uses this term little children. He's not talking to them as if they're child, if, if the children, they're small, they don't understand. He's using this as a term of endearment. He's using this as a term of affection. And he's saying, know the difference. So in verse 1 of 1 John chapter 4, he says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God. So everything that may seem like a good idea may not be a good idea. Everything that may seem like, is this from God, it may not be Satan. Matthew chapter 4, when Jesus is being tempted, you know what Satan tries to use? He tries to use Scripture. Now he's wrong about using it, but he tries to use Scripture. And so John says there are false prophets. John says there are people who try to use the guise in the name of God, but they're not really for God. They're not really living in the way that the Christians should live. They've got some other initiative. They've got some other agenda that they're after. It's not for God. Matthew chapter 7. I'm sure you're familiar with this verse. And verse number 21 says, Not everyone that says, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. Those who do, y'all finish it. The will my Father, those who are obedient, those who are living for God, those who are faithful, those who are doing what God says, those are the people that will get into heaven. We can't just claim the name of God and then go live any kind of way and do whatever we want to. People sometimes think it works that way, but they will be very disappointed if they don't change and repent. Now, God wants them to repent. We as their brothers and sisters want them to repent. But we've got to actually live a faithful and fruitful life for God. We've got to actually do something about it. And so who are we living for in this year that God has given us? He says it's important because there are some things that not, are not of God. Look at verse number 2. By this you know the Spirit of God. How can I tell if it's from God or not? John gives us that answer. He says, Every spirit that confesses Jesus Christ has come into the flesh and that confesses that He is of God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus Christ has come into the flesh is not of God. Now, why would John write something of this nature? In this time, there were people who didn't believe Jesus really was who he said he was. There were these people, they were called the Sadducees. And what were the Sadducees? 
famous for? What were they known for? They didn't believe in the resurrection. They're sad, you see, because they have no hope. They don't believe that Jesus Christ came out of the tomb. They don't believe that he died on the cross for our sins and that he was resurrected. They don't have hope. That's where our hope lies, brethren, is in that resurrection where death is defeated, where sin is finally put in its place, where God finally has to deal with sin once and for all. And he says, those who believe in Jesus Christ and accept him as Lord and have their sins washed away and live their lives as if God is our ruler and king, those are the people that have that peace. Those are the people that have that assurance. Those are the people that have that confidence. And the Sadducees and the people of the world and the convenient Christians, I call them, you know what I mean by convenient Christian? I'm a Christian when it's convenient for me. Any other time I want to, you know, do my thing, well, that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about a life living for God each and every day. We're talking about being as spiritual as we possibly can be. Our, I know our humanity gives us limits. I know we're only capable of so much. But God knows our humanity, and God also gives us things to live our lives by. And so 1 John is a great letter, a great chapter to help us guide that. So look at verse 3. Every spirit that does not confess that Jesus is the Christ and has come in flesh is not of God. Matter of fact, this spirit is antichrist, opposite of Christ which you have heard was coming. Now pay attention to this. Sometimes we are still a little confused and we wonder, you know, why I'm having to deal with so much and why I've got so much on our plate. Look at what John says. And now he is already in the world. Back in the first century, Satan was already at work. He was already trying to target the church. And until the Lord comes back and finally deals with him, as Revelation 20 says, he'll be cast in the lake of fire and all those who don't obey will go there with him. But until that day comes, this is going to happen. And so John gives us the warning. He says, these things are not of God. And as we're living for Christ, we need to know that difference. We need to know what understands what God asks us to do. You know, it might be a good idea to eat a tub full of ice cream before bed. But then I lay down and what's going to happen? I'm going to get a bellyache. And then you say, that wasn't such a good idea. A lot of times that's how temptation works. Is it seems like a good idea at the time. But then we've got to pay for it. We've got to pay for those decisions. And so John says, as a Christian... Living for God, know the difference. Know if this is what God says. Know if this is something God would do. And if it doesn't sound like it's something God would do, more than likely, it's probably not. Now, I understand God sometimes surprises us. God sees things that we don't see. God works in ways that we don't always understand. But in general, a good principle is if it doesn't seem godly, if it's not going to lead me closer to him, if it's not going to glorify him, I probably shouldn't be involved with it. I probably shouldn't be associated with it. Sometimes we have to tell our loved ones that. Sometimes we have to tell people, I'm not trying to serve the world. And my God don't want me involved in these things, so I'm not going to participate. And as Christians, we've got to make those decisions. Look at verse 4. He uses this term of endearment here. He says, You are of God, little children. You have overcome them because he who is in you 
is greater than he who is in the world. What a beautiful verse. God who is in us is greater than those things we're going to face. I don't know about you, that gives me confidence. I know that that's not bigger than my God. I know that that's not bigger than any problems he hadn't dealt with before. I know it's nothing that he can't handle. Sometimes he's trying to teach me patience. <laughs> and I've got to wait on him. But I know he can deal with it. I know he can handle it. I know he's big enough to face it. And I must understand that those that are in me, he who is in me is greater than he who is in the world. When the temptations come, when the trials come, when those who, you know, want to talk down about my character or whatever the case may be, I must understand what this verse is telling me. God will handle it. God will work it out on his schedule. This may be a surprise to some of us, <laughs> but God doesn't work on our schedule. He, he don't listen to what I have to say sometimes. He works on his schedule. And when the time is right and when things are appropriate, God will deal with it. God will take care of it. And he's giving this encouragement that when it seems too much to bear, God is there to carry it for us. Verse 5, they are of the world. And so they speak as of the world. And the world hears them. We are of God. He who knows God hears us. And he who is not of God does not hear us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. How can we know the difference? Well, God tells us here through inspiration of John, he said those who are of the world, they think like the world. They act like the world. They do things the world is going to do. They're going to try to decide things for themselves. And we who are Christians, we know better. We understand that isn't something God wants me to do. That isn't something God wants me to be involved in. And so we need to understand the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Who am I going to live for? How am I going to be more spiritual? So I've offered you some verses here. John chapter 10 and verse number 10. This is the gospel of John. And so you ask, you know, name four books of the Bible. Well, you can say John. Because you've got the gospel of John. You've got 1 John. You've got 2 John. And you've got 3 John. And so you've got the Gospel of John in the early New Testament. And then you've got 1 John and 2 John and 3 John. And in the Gospel of John, he's got this thing. Each letter that Paul writes and Peter writes and John writes, they usually have a central theme. John's theme is the battle of light, representing good, and the battle of darkness, representing evil. If you look at John chapter 1 and verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God, and the Word became flesh, and the light went into the darkness, and the darkness didn't understand it. It didn't understand who God was. It didn't understand the ways of God. And so John uses this similar language here. He says the world isn't going to understand and so we don't need to be worried about the world. We need to be worried about what God thinks. We need to be worried about what God sees. We need to be worried about how does my life glorify Him. And so in John chapter 10, in verse number 10, he's giving them some encouragement. He says, a thief comes in and he takes away. But Jesus came. So we could have life and live it abundantly. Live it confidently. 
Live it knowing that we are the people of God. That we have this calm assurance. John chapter 14 and verse number 6. You all probably know this verse as well. He says, He is the way, the truth, and the life. And the life. You know, sometimes us preachers, we get a hard time. They say, you got the life. And my response is, absolutely. Because I know my God. And I know my Jesus. And I know what he did for me. And I'm going to try to serve him and honor him to the best of my ability. So you're exactly right. I do have the life. Because Jesus says so. Jesus says he's the way. He's the truth. And he's the life that we are to follow, that we are to seek after, that we are to live for. Another verse for us is Galatians 2 and 20. You may have sung this if y'all did vacation Bible school, or maybe it's coming up. But, you know, I'm crucified with Christ, yet not I but Christ lives in me. And I now live by faith, not in the flesh, but in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I'm crucified with Christ. That means that self got buried. Self got crucified. Self got hung on a cross. And my life is now for my Lord. Who am I living for? Who am I trying to follow? Who am I trying to obey? What does my life say when I'm out in the store? Am I living for Christ? When I'm out at the workplace, is Christ reflecting in my life? Did I crucify that self? And people say, there's something different about you. What is it? And that ought to be golden words to the child of God. Because we get the opportunity to tell somebody about our Savior. And then in Revelation 2, in verse 10, at the end of our Bibles, the last book within our text, the encouragement there given to the brethren is you will have trial. You'll have tribulation. You'll have challenges. Some of you may be in prison. Some of you may be punished. Some of you may have hardship. But don't give in. Be faithful until your death. What he's telling those Christians is if it requires your life, you've already given it to God. And in return, you get a crown of life. You get a reward in heaven. And you don't have to worry about this old earth anymore. This old world that's broken and sadness and darkness and evil. We get to be with God. This is such an encouraging verse that as long as I'm on this earth and I've got a conscious ability to make a decision, can I live for God? Can I make him my focus and my aim? Who am I living for? John goes on and gives us some more lessons. He talks to us about loving God here. Verse number 7. How do you know? How will people know if I'm living for God or not? Well, he says, Let us love one another. For love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God. For God is love. Now how do we know? This sweet young couple that are dating and they begin to make things more serious and they begin to consider and ponder marriage and maybe they begin to enter into a time of engagement to say, do I really want to live with this person the rest of my life? And the boy's doing all he can to try to, to make her confident. And she's wondering, does he really love me? 
And I'm sure she likes hearing him say he loves her, but she's waiting on him to do what? She's waiting on her. I mean, she's waiting on him to show. She's waiting on him to show her by the things he does, by the things he says, by the social media he's on, by the places he's at by the events they do together. How can we as Christians say we love God but only spend a little bit of time with Him? How can we as Christians say, you know, I love the Lord, but only on Sunday. I love the Lord only when the lights are on. I love the Lord only when I can share it on media. That's not the kind of love that John's talking about. God didn't just say, I love you. God showed us in verse 9. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us, that God sent His only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through Him in this love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us. And He sent us His Son. Now He uses a big word here. I don't know if we use words like this in Tanner. But He uses this word (laughs) called propitiation. And most of you may know what that word means. But that means our place, or maybe substitute, that God sent Jesus to take our place. Here's how God showed us He loved us by sending His Son to take our place, that He may be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God loved us, we ought love one another. God didn't just say, God showed. And in return, let us, church, not just say. Let us show. Let us love God. And we do that by loving one another. There's so much division going on, so much hatred, and so much he said, she said, and so much all of these things. John gives us the cure right here. All of that can simply be resolved if we take the time to listen. If we take the time to understand that that person is created in the image of God just like I was. That doesn't mean we always have to agree with them. That doesn't mean we have to tolerate their sinful behavior. But we can give them enough respect because God created that person just like he did us. And how do we do that? This world will be a lot better place when Christians stop saying and start showing. When we start being active. When we actually love God. And so what are some verses that help us do that? The Israelites were commanded in Deuteronomy to quote, Every day you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind. And they were to teach that to their children. We love God with all of our existence. We love God with all of our being. We love God with all of our effort, all of our energy, all of our heart, all of our soul, and all of our mind. And then when Jesus goes to the New Testament, he mentions these words in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. He says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind. How do we love? We don't just say. We show. And then finally, we get this verse here at the end of the chapter where God commands us that we are to love Him. If you jump down to verse 17, it says, Love has been perfected among us that we may have boldness in the day of judgment 
because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. A lot of times people have this misunderstanding of God. They think of God as an angry God. They think of God as a God ready to strike judgment, as a God ready to punish, as a God ready to serve justice. But the God of the Bible, the God I worship, is a loving God. God is love. God is patient. God is long-suffering. And He wants to make sure that we live a life for Him that others notice. In 1 Peter chapter 3, in verse number 21, Peter talks about Noah. And in the days of a world that was so sinful that only eight people were saved, Noah made sure his family got on that ark. Noah made sure his life led them to the Lord. Noah made sure his family was saved because he lived it every day. If you look in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 22, it says Noah did all that God asked him to. Noah did everything that was commanded of him, and Noah made sure his family knew it. Noah made sure his family saw it. Noah made sure his family got on that ark. And so the final question and consideration is, who are we leading to God? Who are we showing? Jesus gives us a commandment. He says, he who loves God must love his brother also. Must make sure his family is in heaven. Must make sure that they know what Jesus Christ did. That they know how much God loves us. So the question is, who are we living for? Some verses to help us with that. Who are we leading to Christ? Matthew 5, verses 13 through 16. He says, You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. And he says, You're the salt of the earth. He asks us this question. Let your light so shine that they may see your good works and glorify God. That's a Christian. That's a member of the Lord's church. That's somebody who believes God. That's somebody who loves God. That's somebody who lives for God. And that's somebody who's leading their family to Christ. Can that be said about us? Jesus asked us to do that. And then he tells us, <laughs> In Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20, he says, All authority has been given to us, and then he commands us to go and make disciples. To make sure we lead people to the cross. To make sure we tell them about our Christ. To make sure we tell them what God did for us. That they too may have an opportunity I like to say this, we're not responsible for the results, but we are asked to recruit. We are asked to do our part, and then God will handle the rest of it. And so we can't always control the results, but we can do some recruiting. Mark 16, verses 15 and 16, He who believes and is baptized will be saved. He who is not will be condemned. It's pretty plain and simple. It's pretty easy to understand. Jesus tells us, here's the expectation. Here's what we are to do. And then in Luke 9, 
verse 23. He says, if you want to live this life, it's going to cost you something. If you want to live this life, you're going to have to carry something. And it says, he who desires to follow after me must deny himself. Take up his cross daily and follow me. Noah made sure his family was on that ark. What about us? Are we living for God are we carrying our cross? Are we saying to ourselves, I can't do that because God tells me I can and I'm okay? Because God knows better. And God has something better. God's waiting for His people, for His church to live for Him. So the question I ask who are we living for? Is God the focus? of our life is God in the fundamental fabrics of our daily walk is he our focus do we wake up saying what can I do for God today who are we living for in 2024 I thank you for your kind time and your attention God bless you